so Ruthie, I, we were on the phone just a couple weeks ago, and I, and I said the question, so, so what is it that you do? And you get that question a lot, and I've gotten that question a lot, too, yeah. from myself. So share yes. what you're doing right now. Um, hi. Um, so it kind of looks different a lot. I've kind of, like, dialed in to be able to tell my mom. So half the time, I get to do things like this. I get to share my story, which I feel incredibly honored to get to do. Mm. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit soon. But um, the other time, I do a lot of styling for like photos and events and hosting events. And then I do marketing for brands, and it's all like lifestyle things, like what it would be like to experience this trip with this company, or if you go on this retreat, this is what you would experience. So a lot of that's through social media. So yeah, it's different a lot. I travel a lot. So I love it. Wait, people pay you to travel all over the world? Kind of. It's kind of a good job, right? Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I've just tricked a lot of people, and I don't know. It's, it's really been such a sweet journey. Mm. Really great. Well, good. Well, let's start back of kind of this journey that you've been on. Talk about what happened in high school. Okay. So I didn't really know exactly how to go about doing my slideshow. This is like when we were talking about like jobs and things, but I'm going to skip through some of this, and I can come back. But... So when I was a senior in high school, um, I pulled out in front of an ambulance, and an ambulance hit me on my car door going like 65, and um, I broke three ribs, and they punctured my lungs, my lungs collapsed, and my spleen ruptured, and um, I wasn't breathing, but the ambulance driver had everything there, and we found out I broke the top two vertebrae in my neck, C1 and C2, and I had a less than 5% chance to live and a 1% chance to walk, but he had everything right there to save my life, which is crazy. If it hadn't been an ambulance driver, we know that I would not have survived. And so I was on life support in the hospital for a long time, about a month. Uh, it, was, it was a pretty intense time, and back then, they took um, wire and bone from my hip and wrapped it with wire. That, that's how they did fusions back in the day. So that went well, and somehow after like a month with a big old neck brace, I left the hospital and was walking, and it was kind of just like this miraculous thing, and I kind of went back to life as normal, like nothing had happened, but... Um, and I, I didn't have any residual effects at the time. Like, I could just kind of live life. And by looking at me, you wouldn't know that anything had happened. All my scars are hidden by my hair or by clothing. And so I just kind of went on, like, look, that was a thing and whatever, you know. And when I talked about it, it kind of felt like it was in third person. And it really wasn't, like, an ordeal. I went on to college and I graduated. I had a lot of fun and um, was the worst student but did great. And if I danced too much, I might get sore. But otherwise, I really didn't have any effects from it until um, I moved to Nashville and I met my very first boyfriend, and uh, my parents were super glad he was a boy because they thought I liked girls, and I was like, well, I do like girls, but not that way. Um, so, and we, um, it was, we were just excited. We started our lives together. We got married like 10 months after we met, and it was just really quick, and probably, um, well, I'm gonna show you this real fast. So this was like, I have two photos from the whole accident. This was the week after uh, my surgery and my cute little cheerleading squad is the tallest cheerleader that ever existed. I'm like, it was not normal. Um, but I hated sports, so I cheered. Um, biggest waist of a tall girl that ever was. And, and then this was like a week after I got out of the hospital and I was like so embarrassed because our homecoming parade had been rained out and they put us in the Christmas parade and I had this like big old neck brace and I was like, <laughs> but everyone was so sweet because our community had just come around and like loved us so well. So like those are the only photos from that time. But probably, I don't know, um, 10 months, 12 months into our marriage, all day, one day I was like walking in front of a Starbucks and I felt this shooting pain go up my neck and I felt like I was gonna, I, I fell down. I felt like I was gonna black out and I vomited. And um, it was just this like crazy intense pain and this started happening often. Mm -hmm. um, and it was debilitating and super scary. We started going to see all these different doctors and 
um, every time I would get a film, they would come back and they would look at this, like, there would be this black spot on my film, and they'd look at everything around it, and they'd say, oh, that's just the magnet in the machine interacting with the wires from your spinal cord fusion, everything's fine, blah, blah, blah. I started on, they started me on really heavy pain meds, and I just didn't want to hurt all the time. And I took everything they suggested, and it started this very dark cycle. I, I basically handled chronic pain horribly, and I lived in my bed. Like, this went on, went on for like four or five years. I tried so many therapies, and nothing helped, and this pain just got worse and worse, and I was scared out of my mind, and it was obviously incredibly difficult on a marriage. Like, I can't even imagine how hard that would have been for him, and I handled pain horribly, and um, probably about five years into that, finally a doctor said, we can't tell you what's going on until we see what's under that black spot. And what they realized is this wire had broken and pierced into my brain stem. And I'm the only person that's ever had that, so I have that going for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there's that. And here's one other photo of it. Um, and so basically I got this phone call of like, you, have to, you should be paralyzed. If you don't get it, you will be eventually, but the surgery itself is super high risk of paralysis. And I was just scared out of my mind. Like, it was, um, but no one had done the surgery. So it's not like we could go off a doctor with experience. Um, but I didn't have an option not to do it, because eventually I'd be paralyzed if we didn't. And insurance wouldn't cover it, because it was a pre-existing condition. And it was just this crazy, crazy thing. Do you want me to tell about my dad in this part? Sure, or? yeah. OK. Oh, I'd love to tell you all about my dad, because he's just the most precious human that ever was, ever, ever, ever. So, um, two weeks later, my dad, we called him Papa, was coming to see me and told me that he would sell our farm so that um, I could have this surgery. And uh, the night before he was coming to see me, he ended up falling down of a flight of stairs and passing from brain damage. And it was just this, like, crazy, crazy time, right? And I remember I'd like lay in bed and I'd like pinch myself till I was bleeding because I was like, this can't be real. Like this cannot be real. And um, the thing about him is he loved people so well. And every time we left his presence in the morning, he'd tell my brothers and I like, I love you so much. Remember your manners and always look out for the little guy. And that's what he did. He like looked out for the people that others might miss and that's what he wanted us to do. So my godfather ended up setting up this medical fund in my dad's honor and this crazy amount of money was raised because people would write us letters and be like, and y'all, we were poor. I grew up on a farm in the middle of nowhere. My dad like plowed our garden with a mule, like country. We were not like rolling in money, but people would write letters and be like, your dad bought my prom dress. Like, your dad sent me to college. Your mm. dad pays my tuition. Your dad pays my rent. Your dad fixed my roof. And so this like crazy amount of money was raised because my dad had like loved people so well. Um, oh, like, it was just this beautiful thing. And so I ended up um, getting to have the surgery uh, to keep walking, uh, which is just kind of just a miraculous thing. And we ended up choosing the Mayo Clinic. Doctors are like chomping in the bit to work on someone that no one has had a freak medical condition, you know? And so we ended up choosing Mayo and I ended up, um, this top neurologist, top orthopedic surgeon did my surgery together and they ended up removing the wire and taking bone from my other hip and this time using like eight titanium screws um, to fuse my neck back together. And I left walking, which, you know, was like a huge gift. Um, and I ended up getting a different type of pain from that. I ended up getting really severe nerve damage um, down my right side and so my right side just feels like, like it's on fire all the time, basically. Still. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I left like handling that really poorly. I was on even more pain medication, and I was thankful to be walking, but I was in so much pain, and I went back to like living in my bed and hurting and handling pain horribly. So it was a, it was a hard, I mean, this went on for like another year or two after that surgery. So, so pain has been part of your life since since high school, since and even played out in relationships, right? Yeah, 
Yeah, for sure. It, it didn't really start until my marriage. That's when it, it started getting really bad. It's that I guess that's when, we don't know how the wire broke and pierced in my brainstem, but that's when the pain began. Yeah. So what happened through this with your marriage? So um, probably about a year or so after that, I felt I, um, he was on tour, and he's an amazing musician, and um, I had this, he was on tour in Australia, and I caught this crazy bacterial infection, and I was super sick, and I was living in my bed, and I ended up, kept ending up in the emergency room, and it was just a nightmare, and I could tell that my marriage was coming to an end, and um, I basically had a complete nervous breakdown, like not like funny, like it was like straight up crazy. Like I had a nervous breakdown. I stopped sleeping um, and I finally let my family know like how bad it was. I just felt like my life was over. And to be honest, like I wanted it to be over. I felt completely hopeless. I just lived in my bed at all times and hurt all the time. And I just was like, okay, this is my life. And um, I moved home for like, two months, he, he was on tour, and it was probably the scariest time in my life. Like, I felt like everything was ending, and I, there was no hope for me, and there was no light at the end of the tunnel. And that, hitting that big of a low point, and being that um, just hopeless, was one of the hardest, and probably the best thing that ever happened to me, because it was literally like, I was such a nightmare. It's like whatever you're doing is not working and you have to change everything, you so that, know? That was like the moment where it was like the rock bottom, right? It was, it was beyond rock bottom. Like yeah. I just, yeah, definitely it was rock bottom. It so was, you have experienced this deep sense, honestly, of suffering and pain. And then something came out, right? Something yeah. changed within you. Explain what happened. Yeah. Then redemption. <laughs> yeah. So basically I was like such a nightmare so embarrassed and felt so ashamed of myself. And I remember like I'd lay there and just be like, I, um, so sad that this would be like how my dad could see me from heaven. You know, like I was so ashamed of myself and shame is such a gross thing. And I think it's like from the pits of hell because anyway, I remember having this conversation with my brother and he was like, babe, you can lay in your bed and hurt all the time or you can get up and go be with people and like love people and hurt like where's your better option and I was like yeah that makes sense you know and in that time I decided to wean the probably the best decision of all of it I decided to wean myself off of like almost seven years of really heavy pain medication. Because I was like, I'm still hurting all the time and it wasn't doing anything but mess with my mind. And so I decided to, you know, wean myself off of everything. And it took me like two months. But I remember in that time, it was just, just like beautiful thing. I remember ha probably two months in having this vision of myself in like second grade and getting glasses for the first time and walking outside and being like, mom. Like, look at the sky, look at the birds, like just in awe, you know? And while my body was, hurt, you know, hurting all the time, it was this beautiful thing because all of a sudden I was like, my mind was coming back to me and I was deciding and choosing to change my focus. Like on all that medication, when I was in my bed, all I thought about was like the depravity of the world, the brokenness of my life, the brokenness of everyone around me. But I was choosing to look to the, like the beauty all around me and remembering the things that I loved as a child and looking for beauty in the people around me and speaking it out loud and telling them the beautiful things I was seeing and speaking out loud the like, you know, the sky, like I hadn't seen a sunset in like seven years, you know? And I was like, I was in awe of it. Like it was so beautiful. And that balance of being able to like, I had heard this quote, um, a friend of mine who actually works at Nisolo, I have my Nisolo's on. Um, I had heard a quote from her um, say, it's uh, the deeper that sorrow carves into your being, the more joy you can contain. And I was like, yes. Like, I'm going to be able to experience joy on such a deep level because of the level that I've known brokenness and loss and heartache and pain. And so I was trying to, like, truly live in that space, you know? And, and it was beautiful and it was scary. And all of a sudden, like, two, you know, 
I weaned myself. It took me four months, and like six weeks after that, I, I found myself single for the first time in my life. In, in 10 years, I was, you know, I didn't have the support of my family, and then I was like, I'd been trying to help like manage his music stuff, and then here I was, like, I didn't feel like I had any skill set. I didn't even know I was creative until around that time. And I was like, oh, shit. Like, what am I going to do? Like, how am I going to make money? I don't have any, you know? And I was so, sorry, I said the shit word. Um, <laughs> but I was so lucky, y'all, because I lived in Nashville, and I lived in this incredible community. And I know you, y'all have it here. I've like seen you guys like talk with each other and the way you speak about one another and like this community here is incredible. And we also have that in Nashville. And I was so lucky to be surrounded by people that believed in me before I believed in me. And they spoke life over me and they told me I was creative and I didn't have the luxury of fear anymore. Like I couldn't worry about how my body would handle things. I couldn't worry that I had zero experience. I knew nothing, but... A friend of mine, my friend Amy Stroop, hired me to style the cover of her record. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to say yes. Oh, my gosh, I'm sweating so bad, but I'm going to say yes, you know. And I started an Instagram account. And I started posting things and, like, remembering the things that I loved to do when I was a child. Like, I love hosting dinners. Like, it's, like, literally one of my favorite things ever is to, like, bring people together and, like, um, y'all, I've obviously failed miserably at putting my selection together. But this is like in my backyard. Like I love hosting. I love people. I want people to come to my home. And of course, like I want the, envi the environment to be beautiful, but I really want them to leave and I want them to feel like they are important and it's like matters that they are there and they are special and seen and valued. And so I started trying to create these environments where I could do that, mm. you know, and create environments that are conducive to connection and community. And people started hiring me. I mean, I was just posting stuff I was doing. It's not like I knew anything, but I don't know if people thought that's what I already did for a living or what, but people started bringing me in. And I was, I started having people that didn't know me following me on social media. And I would get these comments from people and they would be like, you live my dream life. Like, I want your life. And I would feel like I was going to vomit because I'd be like, I remembered laying in my bed for years and I'd look on Facebook and I would see and I'd be like, man, I wish I was out playing with my children and doing all these incredible things and not laying here hurting all the time. And the fact that I could emote that emotion from someone else without giving them the full context made me feel nauseous because the truth was, you know, my pain's every second. Like, it doesn't go away. And my, I was walking through a divorce, and that was incredibly painful, and I miss my dad every day, but I feel like I had gotten to this point where I had learned that you can live such a beautiful life despite your circumstances mm. and despite the broken things, and so often we think, like, once I get this husband, I'll be happy. Once I get this job, I'll be happy. Once I get this house, once I get this baby, and it's like, no, like, we choose joy and choose happiness now, and so this beautiful thing happened. I was able to I wrote out my story and shared the full, basically how I'd been a freaking nightmare and handled pain horribly for a really long time. Like, I just wrote it all out and was like, but here's like, there's hope. And if there's hope for me, who has been such a disaster and handled things so horribly and handled pain in the context of marriage so horribly, and, but there is hope. And if there's hope for me, there's hope for you. And I love, like, for me, all, any of the jobs, like, they're such gifts, but, like, the thing that I love more than anything is, like, I want to get to, like, look someone in the eye and be, like, there's hope. Like, this isn't the end of your story. And so much beauty, like, comes out of these broken things. And so often in the midst of them, it's so hard to see that in the midst of suffering. But, like, the most beautiful stuff in my life today was birthed out of the most painful things. And the fact that I hurt every day, it gave me eyes. Like pain, I was so clueless. I just, I was a sweet, happy kid. And I bebopped through life like everything was great. And I thought that's how everyone else felt. And I had no context for empathy. And now like I can look at someone and I can walk with them when they're suffering. I know heartache and I know 
physical, emotional, spiritual pain, and I know death. And there's something so beautiful about having people are just longing to be seen and longing for connection and longing to not feel alone. And when we're open and we're honest about our shit, like it frees other people up to be able to be free and connection and real authentic connection happens there. And that's what I've like gotten out of this. And it's been the most beautiful, crazy, amazing ride. Like I'm so humble that I get to like sit in front of y'all and meet incredible humans. And like, so I've just been talking. You have not even had a chance to ask. This is good. I was going to say and talk with you, but you haven't even got to talk. I'm sorry. I'm just but I, I, think, I think what's happened, and this is why, why I think this is a really beautiful story, is that you've hit a, a hard element of pain in so many areas of your life. And you had to wrestle through that. And then what happened is you started sharing that with people. You started being honest with the realities of your life. And then what happened was that people started responding to you and sharing their pain with you. Yeah. And, I, and, and the reason why I wanted to share your story is that in the midst of whatever work you're doing or whatever story that you have, your story is not gonna be the same as Ruthie's in any way. But there's going to be elements of fear that come in. There's going to yeah. be elements of, of shame that you yeah. talked about where you start comparing yourself to other projects that, that, weren't, that didn't have Shaquille and Ebo put their, their hand on some campaign thing. You're not going to have these celebrities all be a part of the work that you do, and you're going to have times that you want to quit, right? Mm. But in the midst of those times that we need people in community to speak truth into what we're doing. We need people yeah. in our community to encourage us along the way and for us to be honest with that. That's yeah. part of getting the sound advice we need. Would you yeah. agree with that? 1,000%, yeah, of course. So, so as, as you have shared your story more and more with people, what you've realized is the more, I mean, this is what we've talked about, the more you've shared it honestly, the more people that are coming to you sharing their story with you. Yeah, and it's, um, it's so humbling. Um, for some reason, I've had this opportunity and this like, um, I've been given the chance to share it and for some reason my story is connected with people that are suffering and so you know like every day I get emails from people that are suffering and that are hurting and, and I think for me it feels like it makes my pain feel purposeful that if someone like I was emailing a girl back from China this morning I'm like man if my story makes her feel like she can get out of bed today like what an honor that's what makes me want to get off my heat and pad in the morning and not because when I lay in my bed and when I when I live in my pain and in my head all I think about is my pain um but when I get up and go be with people and connect and get to hear these stories and share with other people. Like, I'm not thinking about how I'm hurting right now. Like, truly, I'm not, I mean, it's always there, but I'm not focused on that. Like, this is such a gift and this is such an honor. And it makes, yeah, it just makes my pain feel purposeful. And I think so often with pain, we can either like, it can make you become a bitter person or you, we can let it make us better and more whole and more, full and I want I want it like bitterness just sucks the life out of us and everyone around us and like you know what we've heard so many people talk about like positivity and goodness life giving like we all have hard stuff like everyone has hard stuff and but there's also so much beauty and there's so much beauty that comes out of the pain and out of the suffering. And I, I like, sometimes I get nervous. I don't ever want to sound like Pollyannish and it's like, I love hurting. Like, no, like it's the worst. Like I don't, I wouldn't wish pain or suffering on anyone, but I also know that it makes us better. It can make us better mm. and more whole. That's so, great. Ruthie, yeah. thank you so much for sharing yeah, your story. Yeah, thank y'all. Thank y'all so, so much for having me. Thank you.